Praise the Lord. I want to share with you from Psalm 84 this morning. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord, my host, Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the sparrow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Father God, we love to be in your presence. And though we can't all be in church, we know that you are with us right where we are. You are with us. Lord God, I just ask that right now, everyone listening to this podcast would, would feel your presence, yes, Lord, yes, in a Lord. real tangible way. That even though they are not physically in this house, that you are with them and you are their strength. Lord, I thank you that we can be silent before you and rest in you. Lord, we just dedicate this service to you today, and we just ask you to reveal yourself in a new and greater way. We love you, Lord, and we need you. Amen. Amen. Is there anyone else who wants to start off with a prayer? Anyone else who wants to add? Let it not just say it before the end. Well, we're welcoming you to Lord of the Harvest uh, live stream. Um, let me uh, get the other microphone. I'm a little more comfortable. I'm a little more comfortable with uh, with this. You know, we're in uh, obviously unprecedented times, not just difficult times, unprecedented. I have uh, never seen anything like this in my lifetime. And if you're as old as I am, you probably haven't either. Some of those who are a little older have been through World War II, and we've seen a kind of a, a world gripped, gripped by everything that's going on right now. Um, you know, when, when you have a lot of time to think, which I have a lot of time to think at home, although I'm exhorting everyone to have a lot, to spend a lot of time in prayer. I have a lot of time to think, and you know, the more time you have to think, you, you, can, you, you, you can make yourself afraid, you can make yourself nervous, you can make yourself, you know, paranoid. But I know I, I shared the, um, the Bible study at 10 a.m. And uh, man, when I'm preaching the word, it's like nothing. I know I, I've been in uh, one particular trip I was in overseas. I was there for uh, over three weeks. And from the moment I got there till the moment I left, I was sick. I mean, really sick. And I ended up coming back home and I'd gotten tested and I, I uh, you know, for my illness. And I got a phone call from the health department a few weeks after I got back and said, are you okay, Mr. Osminski? Yes, we want you to know that uh, you brought back a, a parasite of unknown origin. And, uh, and I said, 
can, can, can we name the parasite? Can you name it the Osminski parasite? They, they, they said no, they wouldn't. But, so. but it, was, it was amazing because I was so sick there. I was sick, but every time I would get up to minister the word, every time I would get up to pray for people, every time I would get up to, with the saints, I was okay. And then I'd say, oh good, the Lord healed me. Then I'd go back home and I'd be sick again. And uh, I remember the, the final days of that trip. We were up in the mountains in the particular nation we were. And I, I was so ill, we, we, we kind of climbed up and we're visiting this cold, uh, fresh water stream. And uh, the brothers had to carry me down. I was so weak. I mean, literally, they, 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 a couple of them got me and just carried me down. I was so sick. I know. Uh, uh, Matt and Jan Abbott are here today. I'm, I'm certain. I think Matt's had malaria uh, going to Africa. And parasites. Uh, and parasites. We're, we're, we're brothers in arms right. there, Matt. But the thing is, when I'm preaching the word here, when I'm speaking the word of the Lord, the Spirit of God comes upon you and you're fearless. So the way we're going to do this, we're going to do this a little bit different. We open with prayer. We're going to do the sermon first. Uh, then we're going to do the communion message, and we're going to invite everybody at home who's watching with us to partake of communion with us. When we partake of communion, go get something to drink, go get a piece of bread, and just partake of the body and blood of the Lord together with us. And then we'll close in prayer. But we're, again, just glad to be here. Our service is going to be very simple today. It's prayer, ministry of the word, the Lord's Supper. And while we're missing worship, what we call worship, um, we are uh, actually worshiping the Lord when we're praying. We're worshiping the Lord when we're being obedient. So we're here being obedient. Now, I know we're, we seem to be having a little problem with the sound. Should I go to this mic? Or? No, you just stay there. All right. Our, uh, our, our brothers and sisters here who are our technical uh, experts are being really challenged in this hour as we all are but so just be patient with us the word will go forth by the way there are 11 of us here today so we're uh, and and we're going to say since jesus is in our midst that there are 12 of us here today to re truly represent god's government i i just i have two things uh to discuss today and uh, i'm going to open with a word of prayer lord let your word go forth and let it be Encouraging to your people in Jesus' name. Yes. I say there's two things, but maybe it may end up only being one thing. Uh, we received um, uh, this, this past weekend, we received a prophetic exhortation from a brother that we've known for many years, Jim Lafone. And uh, I want to just, I want to read this and I, I want to share it because I, I believe it's, it's very encouraging. And the direction of it is really simple, as you'll see. But I'm going to tell you the point of all of this. It's called pray, pray, and pray some more. So this is called intervention, colon, responding to COVID-19 from Jim Lafon. On December 31st, 2018 at 10 p.m., while attending a New Year's Eve service, the Lord spoke to me about a great crisis that was coming to the United States. He showed me it would be within 17 months. You know, also, you remember we spoke last week, Steve Fado saw that at the end of last year that something was going to come, and it was going to come soon, and the church needed to get ready for it. I believe that we have been getting ready for this for several years at Lord of the Harvest. If you go back and look at all of the messages, all the things that are being preached. We've been discipling people to be prepared right now. Now, we still need to understand the will of the Lord. Now, these are my comments, not Jim's. I'll get back to uh, Jim's prophecy momentarily. But I quoted this verse last week, and I want us to see it again. Because both for those people who didn't check in last week, who may be wondering, before the Lord, well, why didn't anybody hear about this? Well, the truth is, people did hear about it, or people were preparing 
uh, their, their, their people regardless. If we're discipling people in the word the way we ought to, our people have heard about this. They're being prepared. But Jesus said this, John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So he ties together his love and our obedience. Jesus gives us love. Our response to his love is always obedience. That's, that's really the key. That's, uh, the way we respond to faith is that we, we, we do mighty things in God. We believe. The way we respond to hope is we live as if the gospel is true, whether it's happening or not. The way we respond to the love of God is we are obedient. And then he continues and he said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And remember we said last week, we're contrasting here. Jesus is contrasting being servants of the Lord and being friends. Now, in the Bible study, we talked about what it meant to be a servant. Well, here we're going to talk about what it means to be a friend. I no longer call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For everything that I've heard from my Father, I've disclosed it to you. I've made it known to you. See, this is an hour where we need to become the friends of the Lord. We need to press into Jesus. I talked about this last week. I'm going to continue to talk about it. For me, it's the real key right now. We need to understand what God is doing. When we understand what God is doing, we can respond appropriately. He'll give us strategies. He'll show us what to do, when to do, how to do it. He'll equip us with the greater anointing that's necessary to navigate these difficult times. But he's moving us from being the servants of the Lord to being the friends of the Lord. And that's intimacy, brother. And that's, this, is where, this is where, Father, I pray for all of my brothers and sisters in Christ to just draw near to you and you will draw near to them. Let this be a time in your presence unlike any time we have ever experienced in our life because we need it, Lord. And it is out of your presence we'll, we will emerge as friends who know what to do. Okay, so some people say, well, we didn't, we, we, this has taken us totally unexpectedly. Well, it hasn't taken God unexpectedly. He's moving his plans and purposes forth in human history. But whether we, we, we expected this or didn't expect it or were prepared or weren't prepared, the real issue is, well, it's here. What are we going to do? We press into Christ. So back to Lafon on December 31st, he saw this crisis that was coming. He said, as I sat there praying, I saw the New York Stock Exchange and money markets beginning to sink. As New York continued its slide, California was flipped up in the air and the entire nation began to slide into economic chaos. People began to cry out about a recession and depression. Just as the turmoil in my heart reached a crescendo, the hands of the Lord reached out and caught our nation. I knew then that the United States was rapidly approaching a tipping point and that the church would be the answer. So this is, this is the beginning of his strategy. The church will be the answer. A comment that I, I, I wish to make, and, and I'm not taking anything lightly, I'm not speaking anything out of arrogance, but the United States is being welcomed to the way the rest of the world always lives. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world always lives like this. I was speaking with a man, Jan, before the service, they, they, they've been to Africa frequently. This is, this is, is, is somewhat normal for the church in Africa, for the church in, in, in the impoverished nations. Now, we still need to pray for our brothers and sisters in the nations because their problem is compounded by the fact that they don't have access to health care the way we do. Can you imagine a nation like ours? We have the greatest health care in the world and our health services are being are, are just being ex exploded before us there's no there's there's no more room at the inn we 
are creating makeshift hospitals. Uh, people have been without uh, proper equipment, people in health care. Um, so can you imagine what it's going to be like for our brothers and sisters? So Lord, we pray for a release of signs and wonders in our brothers and sisters in the nations as they continue to mobilize for the gospel, Lord, where they don't have those, those health benefits, Father, in the name of Jesus, let them have the benefit of anointed prayer, that many would be healed and many would be protected. Later, I'm back to Lafoon. In the fall of 2019, the Holy Spirit put China on my heart very deeply. I sensed a time of trouble and shaking coming to that nation and its government. My burden continued to increase as we came to the end of the year. In early January, before the virus had even escalated in China, I found myself praying with a sense of impending doom. The Holy Spirit impressed upon me that thousands and thousands would contact the virus in China and thousands would die. By the beginning of February, I was not just praying for China, I was also praying for the United States. I would hold both nations before the Lord in prayer, night after night. Unlike my prayers for China, however, my prayers for the U.S. were not directed toward the virus. I simply could not shake an imminent sense that God was about to visit our nation. In a sweeping move that would drive back thick darkness and flood the United States with the light of the gospel. As I cried out to the Lord, I was troubled with a question from the Holy Spirit. Can they pay the cost? Can they pay the cost? The question so grippy that I would cease praying and feebly attempt to reply to the Holy Spirit every time I tried to say yes, I was stopped by an ominous feeling that I did not fully understand the cost myself. It was not until COVID-19 manifested on our shores that I began to grasp what this cost would truly entail. We could have the harvest we longed for, but COVID-19 and all of its implications would be the plow that God would use to break up our nations as well as our planet's fallow ground. How do we respond in this epical moment? Although I realized we need a multifaceted response, this is the one the Holy Spirit suggested to me. On Friday, March 6th, the Holy Spirit deeply impressed Isaiah 59, 14 through 16 on my heart. Let's go there. While, we're, while I'm continuing to read what Lafoon says, let's go to Isaiah 59, 14 through 16. I was struck by the fact that God was displeased with the evil and injustice in the world, but he was appalled by the fact that when he stepped down into history, there were no humans to cooperate in his intervention. Now, a quote, uh, my quote, not only does Isaiah 59 speak of this, but the book of Ezekiel speaks of that where the Lord said he wanted to find a man who would stand in the gap for the lamb, when he would find a man to repair the breach in the wall. He couldn't find anybody. So it's the same idea is going to be seen in uh, Isaiah 59, 14 through 16. This left me with a critical... Okay, sorry. <laughs> this left me with a critical question. What is God looking for at this moment in history? Here's what Isaiah 59, 14 through 16 says. And he's uh, quoting it from the NIV. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and dis was displeased. There was no justice. <laughs> what do we always talk about at Lord of the Harvest? justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm. Now remember we, we studied Isaiah 53 in the Bible study. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And this is Isaiah 59 a little bit past that servant song of the revelation of the suffering servant. His own arm achieved salvation for him. Remember salvation means deliverance his own arm achieved Yeshua for him because the Hebrew word for the deliverer or the deliverance is the one who saves, the one who delivers. And Jesus' name, Yeshua, Joshua, Hosea, Jesus, it means the deliverer. His own arm achieved 
deliverance for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. So the Lord wants to intervene, and that arm of the Lord, remember, is the warrior dimension of the Lord. It's, it's through his, his arm that he delivered the sons of Israel from Egypt and the oppression and the, 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 the gods of Egypt. It, it's the signs and wonders that the Lord does. His arm does that. So Lafoon continues, by the following Friday, the Lord began to clarify the intervention he desired. This clarification began with the Holy Spirit reminding me of the story of Aaron being used by God to mitigate the terrible plight described in number 16. Let's go to number 16. This is where a plague comes forth in the midst of the children of Israel as they were wandering in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. A plague is sent in the midst of God's people. And in number 16, we want to see how the plague was averted, how the plague was stopped. And this is powerful. By the way, several weeks ago, on our, our Sunday morning a national prayer call, uh, Jeff Oaks uh, from Master Builders led the prayer, and he referred to this in the prayer, this, this passage, number 16. So we're going to start in verse 44. And I, um, he's quoting from the ESV. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from the midst of this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. The plague came because God's people had rebelled against the Lord. They had rebelled against Moses. God raised up Moses to lead them. They didn't like the way he led. They rebelled against him, and the Lord became angry. Now, remember, Moses and Aaron have been accused of a lot of bad things here. The, the bane of, of the sons of Israel in the wilderness and the bane of, of modern Christianity people leave the church and they, boy, they don't have good words for the leadership. And as we talked about in the Bible study, leadership can have bad words for them back or leadership can do what leadership is called. When people wound us, we can release God's healing grace upon those who wound us. So the Lord wants to destroy the entire congregation because of their rebellion. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. And falling on their faces is a picture of what? Intercessory prayer. And they fell on their faces and Moses said to Aaron, take your censer. It's the incense. Remember tipping the bowls of incense. It's, it's the intercession of the saints in the book of Revelation. We always pray about tipping the bowls of incense. Well, they're going to tip the, the incense right now. Take your censer. That's the, the container of the, of, the, of the incense that's going to be burned. Take your censer, put fire on it from off the altar, fire from the altar of sacrifice, and lay incense on it and carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Do we understand when we're praying to end this, this coronavirus, COVID-19, this pandemic, we are making atonement for the people of the earth with our, with our intercession. We're covering people's sin and saying, God, be merciful. Please, we need to understand none of us are worthy to escape the plague. Our worthiness is because we have faith in the one who is worthy. We need to keep, keep that in mind. I mean, we can, as Christians, say, well, you know, the, 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 the world is, is getting what it deserves. You know, God preserved the church, but if we all get what we deserve, we're all going to be in trouble. So they, they're making intercession. The wrath has gone off from the Lord. The plague has begun. So Aaron took it, as Moses said, and ran into the midst of the assembly. They ran right into the middle of the plague. And behold, the plague had already begun among the people. And he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stopped. That's just a perfect illustration of the meaning of intercession. It's to stand between God and the people. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the affair of Korah. And Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of the meeting when the plague was stopped. 
this was a combination of, of the people rebelling and Korah and Dathan and Abiram also rebelled. And not only did the people rebel against Moses and Aaron, but some of the, uh, his leaders had rebelled against them as well. Lafoon says, unlike COVID-19, this plague was a seemingly instantaneous killer. Moses and Aaron refused God's invitation to get away. The Lord said, get out of, get out of my way. I'm going to discern it. They got in the Lord's way. Isn't that amazing? That's all throughout Scripture. That's really intercession. Remember back in Exodus 32, the Lord said, look, when, when, the, when Moses went up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments and he didn't come down for a while, people made a golden calf and started worshiping false gods. And when, when Moses came down from the mountain, the Lord said, get out of my way. I'm going to destroy every one of these people and I'll make a new nation out of you. Now, sometimes when the Lord says, get out of the way, he wants us to say, no, Lord, I'm not going to get out of the way. You know, sometimes when the Lord says, I'm going to judge somebody, don't say, yeah, judge them, Lord. We need to get in the way of the Lord and say, don't judge them, Lord. And the Lord looks down and says, that's my boy. That's the real heart of the Lord, is mercy. Moses and Aaron refused God's invitation to get away, even though thousands of Israelites were dropping dead all around them. Instead, Moses stood his ground and ordered Aaron, armed only with a censer, armed only with prayer. Lord, what, what are the weapons of our warfare? You, you know in, in Ephesians 6, the last weapon of the Ephesians 6 armor is praying in the spirit. That's, that's a, a weapon of warfare. Moses stood his ground ordered Aaron, armed only with a censer, to run in the very heart of the plague's kill zone. Scripture states that Aaron stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stopped. This passage led me to examine the whole subject of plagues during the 40 years Israel wandered in the wilderness. There were at least four plagues, including the one I just described. Here are the other three, and you don't have to turn, he just had brief quotes. Exodus 32:35. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. And I, I, uh, I just mentioned that. In Numbers 11.33, while the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. That's when God was feeding the people with manna, but they wanted quail. And the Lord gave them quail, but a plague came along with the quail. The lesson there is eat what God gives you. Eat that and don't desire something else. It will do you just well. And then the third one is in Numbers 25. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. Lafon continues, we know that the severity of the plague mentioned in Exodus 32, 25 was mitigated by Moses' intercession before it ever started. The plague of Numbers 25-9 was stopped through Phineas's intervention after 24,000 people had died. And he says, look at Psalm 106, 29 and 30. Why were all three men who stopped these plagues from the tribe of Levi? Obviously, Moses was, the, was Israel's leader, and the other two were priests, but I think there's a deeper reason. The consecration rituals and purposes of the Levites are described in Numbers 8, 5 through 22. And he's just going to quote verse 19 if you want to go there while I'm finishing. Numbers 8, 19 uh, below is germane to this discussion. In this verse, we find there is something in the lives and ministries of the Levites and not just the priests that was directly related to keeping Israel free from the plagues. What does this verse have to do with us? So there's something in the ministry of being a Levite, the Levitical ministry, that keeps Israel free from plagues. And Numbers 8.19 reads in the ESV again, And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons, that's the high priest, from among the people of Israel to do the service for the people of Israel at the tent of meeting, and make atonement for the people of Israel, that there may be no plague among the people of Israel when the people of Israel come near the sanctuary. The job of the Levites is to stand in the presence of God and keep.
people play away from God's people? The answer is everything. If the Old Testament priesthood and the Levites had the power to mitigate plagues, what about those God declares to be his holy priesthood in the New Testament? Look where the holy priesthood from. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So Lafoon takes everything he's seen and everything he's prayed about, and here's his conclusion. What about us and the movements we represent? I am convinced that if we will all, key word, unite. We, we had a national prayer, a national prayer time with Master Builders leaders uh, last Wednesday. And we had 12 people praying. And the last three who prayed, they were scheduled to pray, the last three who were scheduled to pray all prayed unity. Unity is very important right now. You know, this is an hour is put aside petty arguments, doctrinal arguments, you know, issues with brothers and sisters who don't see it or do it exactly the way we do. And we need to rise up in unity. I'm convinced that if we all unite and rise up as one body across the United States, we can mitigate this plague and prepare the way for the move of God's spirit we all desire. This, however, will take more than a conversation. Could it be that God will use us to birth a movement of prayer that captures the hearts of America's preachers and the people they lead? In an hour when the only buildings we have left to meet in are temples made without human hands, may the homes of the people we serve become houses of prayer. That's why I think this is so important and so on target. So what do we need to do? We need to pray, pray, and pray again. Now I said I have two points. That was my first. Let me look at the second, and that's in John 17. And it, it, it flows right along with this. One of the things that I have really been hearing in my time with the Holy Spirit is about the people that God has given us as leaders at, at Lord of the Harvest. Jesus' final prayer in John 17, he's constantly making reference to the people you've given me, Lord. And he prays for the people you've given me. We need to pray for the people God has given us, for the people who are under our authority, <clears throat> under our watch, in relationship to us, and we need to pray. My prayers have not been complicated this past month or so. They haven't been complicated for a while. They've been pretty simple prayers. Protect this person, Lord. Heal this person, Lord. Empower this person, Lord. Reveal yourself to this person, Lord. Break the spirit of Corona virus in this person, Lord. Really simple prayers just going over and over and over, praying for God's people. Jesus says, and we'll highlight just a couple verses from John 17 in, in his prayer. John 17, 6, he says this, and this is the prayer of leadership in the body of Christ. This is the pastoral prayer. This is a prayer of relationship. This is a prayer of discipleship. Jesus says, I have manifested your name, Father, to the men whom you've given me out of the world. God gives people to leaders. They were yours. You gave them to me. They have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you've given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they believe that you sent me. God gives us people, and he gives us the word to give to people. I pray for them. This is what we do for the people God has given us. I pray for them. He says, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. 
He's not saying we don't pray for the world, but he's saying our primary prayer, first and foremost, are for the people God has given us. And after that, we, we, we pray for the world. That's, that's what Paul says. He says, do good to all men, especially those of the household of God. We, we, we give a priority to the household of God, and then we pray for everybody else. My order is usually praying for the church, praying for my family, and praying for the world. And by the way, it's okay to pray right now for our leaders, our governmental leaders, our, 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 our health officials, that they act wisely and that the Lord gives the world a healing, a cure for this pandemic, to get, get the handle of this, to, to reduce illness and, and casualties, and then the church can step in to the, to, to the, the atmosphere that the Lord has created in the earth and preach the gospel. He says, I do not pray for the world, but I pray for those you've given me. They are yours. Watch all this emphasis on those you've given me. All mine are yours. Yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. We're praying that God will raise up the church to glorify Jesus. But I am no longer now in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Pray for those you've given me, those you've given me, those you've given me. We have a responsibility to those God has given us. And, and, and all these things, that those you've given us, Lord, will glorify you, that those you've given us will be protected, that those you've given us, Lord, will be healed, that those you've given us will be one, even as Jesus and the Father are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those you gave me. Look how many times he refers to this. I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. We have 11 here today, right? No Judas, that's right. Hallelujah. We can't necessarily prevent a Judas from being a Judas, but everyone else, we can keep them and pray for them and strengthen them. But now I come to you in these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Well, how do we pray for those God has given us? Keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. How do we pray for those God has given us? We pray that God would sanctify them, set them apart by truth. As, as you have sent me in the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctified myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Do we understand as leaders, we sanctify ourselves, that others might be sanctified? And then we send others out into the world equipped, prepared. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And now we're, we're, we're going right with what Lafoon said, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. As we come together in prayer, in unity, we are going to release what? A level of faith for people to believe Jesus, for people to encounter Jesus, for people to be touched by Jesus, for people to be healed by Jesus. See, what's missed sometimes in that verse is it's not the unity necessarily that unveils the glory of God. The unity releases a level of faith in the church to reveal the glory of God, that the world may believe, that the world may have faith so if we're pressing into a, a greater anointing, Scripture is saying it takes faith to be unified, to, to, be, to understand true biblical unity. It takes faith. And to walk in unity, the faith that even gets us to walk in unity releases a new level of anointing in unity. I in them, you and me, that they may be made complete in oneness, that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. 
Unity not only releases a level of faith, but it releases a level of love. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me, it's, he's, he's constantly talking about that, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. One final remark. I said two things. Let's go for three. Let's shoot for three. I had this discussion with my leadership team by text last night, and I, I, I just, I, I want to refer back to it. We were talking about the issue of death. We're, 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 we're faced with something right now. And I want you to go to Luke 13.
from moving forward in Christ. Jesus will have the final say. And then I quoted 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Now, that's Paul's uh, elaboration of death and resurrection in, in 1 Corinthians 15, and his point is, is there's resurrection after death. But then right after that, in the same passage, this is what he continues. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, in the light of this fact that death is a reality, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And he said that right after. Death, where is your victory? Great, where is your sting? So, Father, we just... Uh, we conclude this message. We, we ask for your encouragement. We ask for your strength. We ask for your power, Father, in this hour to walk as a church, to make intercession. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Now, Matt Abbott is going to come up here, give us an exhortation. He's going to lead us in prayer, and we're going to partake of communion while you're listening to Matt's exhortation. Uh, Everybody at, at home, uh, please get, get yourself ready for communion. Matt, come on forward. Can, can you turn this one back down to the main one? It's been about three and a half weeks since our world started turning upside down. It started, um, and so all of us, are think, been thinking about, been praying about how is this going to affect us? How are we going to be able to manage this? Uh, a lot of us have come to be now without a job, with the, the lockdown happening and, um, you know, the close downs, uh, everything closing down. Um, some of us that have lost our jobs, and I personally have my business, a business of my own, some of us have lost our job but are still getting paid. Some of us have no income coming in until further notice. I myself, um, with what's happening, all of my business is closed down for the next, uh, till, till June sometime. I have um, no way of making any money that I know of. And big overhead still going out every month just to carry on my business. So, uh, but I'm here to share a testimony with you that um, I believe that as I was seeking the Lord and thinking about uh, all this happening as it began to happen, what is God gonna do and what's God got in mind? I'm gonna share a testimony with you that I believe that God answered my prayer, that God spoke to me, that God illustrated things to me. That's a word from the Lord to me and to our, us at our church as well, to, to others. So about three and a half uh, weeks ago, I left on one of my business trips. I go around the country and I set up at car shows, classic car shows around the country selling uh, neon signs. I set up a big display of neon signs. So I left, and when I left, there was no uh, thinking about there being any problem here in the country, things being closed down, business was going on as usual. My business had been going really good for a while. And then when I left, uh, continuing on his business, making orders for more stuff in the future. And then I got to the show in Fort Worth, Texas, unloaded and set up for two days, set up this big, beautiful display. And then we started hearing things every day before it happened. I was calling home saying, Jan, have you heard what's happening in the news today? Have you heard what's happened today? Have you heard what's closing down? And then, um, then the next day, there'd be more accelerated things happening so fast, you know, um, and, and say, do, do you believe what's happening? Do, do you believe what you heard? And stuff. And then um, we're all set up for the uh, event. And then the morning, four hours into the uh, first day of the show, the, the show got closed down. 
And so the show was over. All this big setup for two days uh, was, was for almost nothing. Although amazingly, I made some sales in that first morning, even though it was torrential rains that morning. And, um, but the government shut us down. All events, big, big events being closed down. So we broke down. And then I had another show to go to in Scottsdale, Arizona next. And um, that was, we got word that that was closed down. Although surprisingly, amazingly, I felt like I was at, uh, when I left for the show, I thought I was in kind of a handicap for these two shows because this time I actually had so much prearranged sold um, that I didn't have room for as much as stuff as I wanted to have and needed to have to conduct these two shows. But I called these customers in Scottsdale, Arizona, and they still wanted their stuff, even though uh, this was happening. So I drove to Scottsdale, Arizona. But of course, this is heavy on my mind. Everything is closing. All my business is closing. I got all this, and I don't save money. You know, I don't have much savings to, to and I got continual big money going out every um, uh, month. And now uh, my niche business is closed down for at least the next three months and I don't even know what how God's going to provide. So I'm driving across the country. My son David's with me this time. I'm driving across the country and I'm thinking it's on a Sunday morning. I'm driving. I'm probably in the mountains or somewhere of New Mexico. And I'm thinking in my mind, man, this is time when church is meeting together back home. This is coming up, you know, and so I'm just thinking we're all seeking the Lord right now. We're all wondering what's happening, you know, what God's going to do. And there's reason for um, fear and confusion and wonder. And I'm thinking it's also uh, president had just called for a 12 noon uh, uh, time of prayer for the country on that Sunday. And I'm thinking, I'm just, so I'm thinking, uh, you know, what's God going to do? You know, I'm thinking this is an important time. I'm thinking we're all seeking the Lord right now in this uh, stuff that's happening. And so as I'm driving along, all of a sudden I hear a pop. So I turn around I, and I say to David, I said, I think I just got a flat tire. And he said, no, I don't think so. But I pulled over, walked around to the back and saw I had a flat tire on my trailer. And so then I'm sitting there thinking, wow, I am in the middle of nowhere in the mountains in New Mexico. I haven't seen anything for a long way and I've kind of unprepared. I don't have a uh, jack with me to change my tire. So then I'm thinking, okay, this is just great. And it's on a Sunday too, where most things are closed and I'm out in the middle of nowhere. So then I start walking back to the front of the truck and I go, hey, David, what is that sign up there? I see a sign up there, what's that say? And he looks and squints and goes, rest area so like 50 feet ahead i mean 50 yards ahead is a rest area and so it's like i can pull over into this rest area and i'm thinking wow yesterday last night when i was driving when i started getting sleepy and wanted to pull over to sleep for the night in the truck sitting in our two front seats you know I mean, I drove for about two to three hours looking for a rest area so I could pull over and sleep, and I couldn't find a rest area. But now, when I needed a rest area, it happened right before a rest area. And there's more details to the, the, this story, and, you know, as it unfolds, I'll tell you, but I felt like the Lord spoke to me. I even told David right there, I said, I believe that the Lord is illustrating something to me right now. You know, the Lord's showing me something. He's giving me some answer to some prayer because I'm thinking about, uh, you know, um, what we're all thinking. And I'm thinking um, the right now I'm saying, you know what? It's like, even though I may be unprepared in some ways, God's got a provision and a solution waiting for us right in front of us. And I felt like the Lord was speaking to me. And then I thought, you know what? Now some other people, some skeptics, if they were talking with me, they might say several things. They might say, no man, you just had a lucky break. That, you, that just happened 
for you right at that time, right before that, that's, you just had a lucky break. But many of us have learned it's, it's not about breaks. You know, God is in control of our lives. Every detail, those of us who have been following him know that's true. We've learned that he's in control. And I thought then some other skeptics might say, man, that's just an interesting set of circumstances that fell into place like that. It's a mystery, isn't it? And I'm thinking, no, it's not a mystery, man. This is God. Anybody that travels with me on my shows, they might start out as skeptics, but they see um, that regularly I experience God intervening in details in my business and money and so on and so forth. And then I thought, okay, there's one other skeptic that might say, well, you know what? If your God is so good, even a better testimony would be, even a better uh, um, statement, declaration for God would be that that didn't even happen. That everything just went smooth for you along the way. You didn't even get the flat tire. But I just felt like, no, the Lord's saying, no, there'll be some trouble. There's going to be some trouble here. But I got the solution and the provision for you waiting for you right ahead. So then I, I continue and I just drive up into the rest area. I call up AAA. I, in Sunday, in the middle of the mountains, they came pretty quick. And then somebody came and they fixed my tire, and when it was over, um, I, 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 I um, one thing, I told them, I said, hey, uh, you're from around here, can you tell me uh, where I can maybe find, buy a tire, so I'm not driving the rest of the way across the country without a spare tire? And you know, and, and he said, uh, hold on just a minute, let me call my place, um, we don't really have a lot of tires or anything, but let me see if we got one. And he calls up, he looks at the kind of tire I got, and uh, he's, he, he gets back off the phone and says, yeah, we got one for you. Then I go back to buy his tow truck, and uh, um, like we got talking and stuff, and like I, I said, man, I'm glad you brought a strong jack. Because I told him over the phone, make sure whoever comes, this is a heavily loaded trailer, make sure you bring a big enough jack. I've had it happen before when somebody came and it wasn't strong enough to pick it up. So I said, I'm glad you brought one. And he said, yeah, I brought one that's more than big enough. But you know, it ended up being that um, I actually needed a second jack that I happened to have with me because I ran into some complications and I was able to succeed and get the job done. And so, um, then I was thinking, you know what? Um, it's, it, it's interesting that um, a little tidbit of information, I was thinking, you know, this guy that came to, to help me and stuff, and that was an answered prayer right at the moment. You know, he was, he was an African-American guy, about a middle-aged uh, African-American guy, and he looked like poor. He had a t-shirt on that had more holes in it than it had fabric on it. I mean, it was just full of holes, kind of like representing, you know, someone kind of in poverty, you know, uh, just lucky that he had that job to make some money. And, you know, I just felt like, you know, as Pastor Oz has often sometimes said, you know, um, when we start getting into some times of challenges, some times of difficulties, you know, um, we can learn a lot from our, those, a lot that are in the, a lot of the African American community because they're used to hardship. This is their way of life, you know, instead of it being so shocking to us and stuff, they're used to it. So we could learn from them, be benefit from them, be blessed by them. Um, and so then, when just before, as we were going to sign the paperwork and stuff, um, David and I went over by his truck, and David says to me, he said, hey, look at that, Dad. Look at that on the side of his truck. And there was like a Christian logo on it. So I said to the guy, I said, hey, that's interesting. You got a Christian logo on the side of your tow truck. I guess the, the business owner is a Christian, eh? And he said, yep, yeah, he's a preacher. And he says, you'll meet him when you go over to, to um, uh, go get your tire. So, and I said, okay, so where are we going? He said, the next exit right up there. 
And he says, we'll drive off about two, two miles off the freeway, just follow me. I get there, we drive over there, still kind of in the middle of nowhere, on a Sunday where he, he told me, he said, normally when people run into trouble out here, they're stuck here through the weekend till uh, Monday morning when businesses open up to help and garages and stuff in other areas away. So, but the Lord provided for me right there and then. So when I get there, I met th this preacher, the guy that owned the business, and it was a pretty interesting place. And he had um, out in front, or oh, the guy, the tow truck guy told me, when I told him about my business too, with classic cars and stuff, he said, well, oh, you gotta meet my boss too. He has all cars out front, he, you know, and, and he's got like a little museum. I get there and he's got this little outdoor car museum. It's outdoor museum. I took pictures of the cars and stuff and they all got Christian logos on them and stuff. He's just this, out in this little small community, out in the middle of nowhere. He has a, it's all on the same property. His house is there. Um, his little outdoor museum is there. A pole barn around back. Um, for uh, um, that he's got some tires and whatever else in there and he's got one or two truck, tow trucks and then he's got another building there and on the side of it it says you know Sunday services is such and such time stuff like that so it's all right there so it was uh, interesting um, and it's like so that is also another thing illustrating to me that um, you know God uh, is going to team us together with others other Christians, God's going to provide, you know, whatever is needed. I have no idea what God has in mind for me. I have no idea, you know, it's, it's, there's really uh, nothing that, that I, I, I can think of, you know, so, but um, God began to show me. Then I started seeing one that he already supplied for this month, even though my two shows got canceled. Um, you know, it just so happened this time that I had more stuff prearranged sold than, than I probably ever had before in a, a trip like this, and it still happened even though my shows were canceled. And then I had one other bit of business already prearranged, and that came together. And then when I went to Scottsdale and I had to uh, meet with these customers, they weren't coming to the shows because there was no shows, so I had to go to their houses. When I went to their houses, they said, since you're at our house, what else you got? And then they buy some more stuff. So it's a lie. Lord made a way to provide for it and stuff. So, anyways, then the um, then and I was just thinking, God was illustrating all this stuff to me. Um, and then the last thing uh, that I saw uh, when I was at this guy's place, when I was getting ready to leave, I looked at the back of uh, this guy, I saw the back of this guy's tow truck. And on it, it said, and it, I saw that it had it on some other ones too, said, um, if God is your co-pilot, switch seats. <laughs> and you know, that's what God's trying to get to us. That's what I'm, 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 I'm thinking is even the bigger message here, you know? I mean, Finances, number one, is not the most important thing in our life, okay? I mean, I believe that God is going to provide, you know, one way or the other, though I don't have a clue, but he's provided so far for this month. Now, you know, just go ahead and do what's right, the, and I believe the Lord will provide. The, um, the most important thing, though, is not necessarily even, you know, our, our money. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that we are right with God that we are obedient to God. Whether God's provisions are not, uh, they're probably not gonna be that everything is gonna be just fine the way it always was. I'm gonna make just as much money. Um, he doesn't need to make, that's not the most important thing anyways, but he'll take care of the most important thing if I'm um, right with him. Uh, Romans 8 verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I believe that that's not just for the glory that's going to be revealed in us in eternity, but God wants to bring something good out of this suffering and these challenges now that will be glorious 
in our individual lives and in our church and in this country and in this world as this pandemic is affecting everybody. God is uh, uh, wanting to do something with this. And so what he wants us to bring us to, again, to close, if, if God is your co-pilot, switch seats. We need God to become the pilot. We need God to be the driver. We need to let God be God. We need to let God be number one in our lives and us alongside with him. So um, should I pray over communion? Yes. So dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we acknowledge and we think about Jesus and remember you and what you have done, Jesus, as we partake of communion. Lord, we remember that you have sacrificed your life, that you came and you sacrificed your life and you died on the cross. You shed blood and died on the cross. We remember these things, what you have done for us. If we, if nothing, if we do nothing deeper, remember nothing deeper, get nothing deeper out of communion than this, doing this weekly, remembering what you have done, that you have brought us salvation. You have bought us, brought us redemption. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we worship you. We reverence you, dear God, as we do this and give you thanks, Lord God, and praise and worship for what you have done. We will never leave you if we just keep uh, remembering this about you because we have gratitude, forever gratitude for your forgiveness of sins to us, your redemption, salvation. We thank you, Lord, for what you intend to do, and we pray, God, that you will perform it in each of us, dear God, individually, and in our church, Lord God, that you will become God. You will become number one in our lives. And we pray this for our country, for our local church, for our country, and for the body of Christ throughout this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt. We're going to come up and partake of communion. And those of you at home, uh, please uh, partake of communion with us. Get something to drink and a piece of bread. Lord, as your people partake of your body and blood, may people be healed. May, pe may people be protected. May people receive the word of the Lord. May people be filled with the Spirit. May people receive your word of comfort. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. live stream. The way you get to this, uh, and all of you who are watching should know this, but this is for information in the future. fb.me backslash lhcf.war. That, that's our, our website. lhcf for Lord Harvest Christian Fellowship dot war. We click on 
on the view to watch it live or after service, we can go to that same website, lhcfwarrenoneword.com, click on the menu video. The message is on the website embedded in the podcast by the following day. You go there and you click on podcast. We are going to continue right now with our Bible studies uh, on Sunday mornings from 10 to 11 and the regular service uh, at 11 as we had today. We are also going to provide uh, online Bible studies and prayer meetings. Right now, on August the 8th, we are going to start uh, an online Bible study. It's the Zoom format, so you have to be invited to that. So anyone who is interested in participating in that online Bible study, there will be Wednesday nights beginning April 8th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. It's called Kingdom Education. It's going to be a, a Bible class on print, biblical principles held uh, online every other Wednesday evening, and we'll, we'll have that posted on the website, the actual dates, from 6.30 to 7.30. Pastor Adrian Bird will be leading. There will be teaching, questions answered, uh, and uh, the format will be to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Uh, as I said, we will be implementing a Zoom format for this teaching. You will be able to take this class using your cell phone or your computer. If you're interested, send an email to us uh, at lhcf1 at comcast.net. That's the church email, lhcf1 at comcast.net. Or call 586-498-8869. You need to be invited online by text. Uh, by invited online or by text to this meeting. So you can, that's why you have to sign up for the class to get into a Zoom format. You, you'll get an email or a text form. You just, you, you hit the link there or you dial the number there. There's a code. And so you need that code to get into the meeting. So uh, please contact us if you're interested. Also, keep in mind our Thursday night corporate prayer, which means from 7 to 8 every Thursday, um, is also going to be on the Zoom format now, and you have to do the same thing. You have to get invited. So contact Lord of the Harvest if you want to be involved in that. Tithing. We now can tithe to Lord of the Harvest through PayPal. Again, you go to lhcfwarrenoneword.com. Click on Donate and follow the directions. You do not need to have a PayPal account to donate through PayPal. Uh, those who are, are regular members of Lord of the Harvest, you can uh, also tithe by mail, uh, or if you're not a, a member of Lord of the Harvest, and we have a post office box, so the checks will be made out to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship, P.O. Box 26505, Fraser 48026. The final thing I want to say, and I just want people to continue to hold us up in prayer, we are continuing to keep our food bank open. Our food bank is open Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays from 9.30 till noon. We need volunteers to come up. But just pray for us because this is considered an essential service and we actually give out a lot of food at Lord of the Harvest. We don't have a small food bank. We have a large food bank. So just continue to pray for us uh, as we continue to uh, serve the neighborhood with the gospel through that uh, the food bank, the food pantry. Again, it's it's open Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays from 9:30 till noon. Now we're going to close with prayer. I know um, Teresa will be Teresa Vanderus will be the final prayer, but if we have anybody else who wants to pray uh, before Teresa closes, come on up now and. One of the things that really was impressed upon me just the past couple of days, when the, when the virus first started out, people who were infected and people who died, for the most part of the country, were just a number. They, they were anonymous. You know, yeah, they had family and yeah, they had loved ones, but for the most part of the country, it was just a number. 
the number of uh, infected and the number of dying just gone up. Within recent days, for me personally, and it may just be for me personally because other people, the, the people who died or infected weren't a number. Faces and names have been attached to those people being infected and those people dying. And it brought it home to me the seriousness of our prayers, the seriousness of the situation. Yeah, it was serious, but I believe it's been kicked up a couple of notches. So I just encourage, let us pray Pray, pray. We've heard this over and over again. Let us pray to uh, the, the degree of seriousness in which this is happening. Father God, Lord Jesus, we come before your throne in your name. Lord, forgive us for not taking this as seriously as it is in reality. Lord, I just pray that you raise up your people another notch or two, that we may intercede for those who are being infected. We may intercede for those who are dying and the families of those who are dying of this, Lord God. Lord, Lord, we cry out to you. Lord Jesus, move. Lord Jesus, deliver. And Lord Jesus, heal. In, in your precious and mighty name. Amen. Lord, I want to pray for the health care workers who are on the front lines. I have a daughter and a granddaughter who are on the front lines, and uh, many of us have very close to us on the front line. So, Father, we pray for our health care workers, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would protect them, you would watch over them. Lord, if anybody is actually living the gospel, it's these faithful nurses, doctors, aides. Uh, Lord, they're just out there, Lord. Office staff, Lord God, just are there, Father, on the front lines ministering grace. Protect them. Keep them safe from illness, O oh God. Help them to uh, bring comfort to the, 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 those who are ill, Lord. Even in some cases, Lord, those, those who are, are dying, Lord, let them, let them be there as your representatives, particularly, Lord, for those who are believers, particularly those who know Jesus, Lord. May you not only uh, use them to bring health care, but may you empower them to be witnesses of Christ in the gospel, Lord, and to, and to release your, your healing and your testimony, Father. Grant it, Lord, uh, particularly I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Pastor Bob Cantor, who used to pastor a, a church, a uh, Master Village Church in Long Island. I know he retired from pastoring. I'm not certain whether he, he retired from the profession, but he's in the ER rooms in New York City working said, I'm, I'm, I'm not praying about uh, myself, I'm not, I'm not worried about the virus, but just the, the massive amounts of people that can be overwhelmed, Lord. Be with Bob and those like him, Lord God, just to continue, Lord God, to uh, serve uh, in his capacity as a doctor and be anointed in his capacity as a minister of Jesus Christ to bring forth your Some of us were at a gathering where somebody had tested positive for corona, and my son was actually in close contact with this person. And you know, my first thought when I was talking to my son was, "Oh man, your wife is going to freak out." <laughs> you know, so we were really praying uh, for her, really. And um, you know, so I, I went about you know my business, and I just got like hit with this fear, you know, because it's your kid. And then you're like, okay, we, I was there, Joe was there, but. 
you know, we weren't, I wasn't concerned about that because we weren't, didn't have any contact with the person, but, you know, it, it just, I was hit with that fear. And that wasn't the first time that happened, you know, since it's been going on, you know, because um, our work was open, so we had patients coming in and out all day, very close to us, coughing in our faces, and people coming in sick. So, you know, you'd be fine one minute, and the next minute you'd be, like, in this fear mode. So um, the Lord spoke this verse to me, um, and it just said, um, the Lord reminded her, she's not afraid for her household. And I'm like, oh, that's Proverbs, you know, and I'm going gonna, gonna to have to go and look, look at that. And what it says is it's Proverbs 21, and girl, like, you should read through the whole thing because it's really good. It says, she's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. And I just thought, well, that's kind of odd because it's, one, it's snow. But you know what, this is, if you read through it, she has a vineyard, you know, and that, it, snow would destroy what you're trying to grow and your livelihood. And you think of a vineyard, I mean, it's not only, you know, um, producing something for other people, it's also your income, it's, I mean, just the imagery and that spoke to multiple things for me. But the thing that I was, I'm like, Lord, I don't get it. She's, for her household is clothed with scarlet. I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? What they're wearing. And the Lord said, Scarlet is my blood. And then he also said to me, what if this woman is not the, the female head of the household? What if it's my church? What if it's the body of Christ is not afraid of snow for her household, for the body of Christ is clothed in scarlet? And I'm like, yes, yes, Lord. So I know there's so many people that are getting hit with this fear periodically, and, and I think it's really rampant right now, and just everywhere, that we remember that we're with the body of Christ, and we're clothed in scarlet. And we do not have to fear this COVID-19. We have to be wise, but we don't have to fear. So Lord, I just pray for the body of Christ. I pray for the body of Christ in Michigan, Lord, for our brothers and sisters in New York and around the country and around the world, Lord God, that we would remember Lord God, that we, your church, Lord God, are clothed with scarlet, and we are not to walk in fear. Lord God, and we take that um, incense, and we run between COVID-19 and be between your house, Lord God. We apply the blood of the Lamb, Lord God, that, that uh, we stand firm at, Lord, because of you, and we stand between this disease, Lord God, and your people and our families, Lord God, and the healthcare workers, and we say, do not touch them in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that we have this assurance in you, Lord God, that it's not faith that we muster up. It's not um, anything that we do in and of ourselves, Lord God, but it's because of you, Lord God, and the sacrifice you have made, Lord God, that we do not fear, Lord God, and that we have health and that we have healing in you. So, Lord, heal those who are sick, Lord God. Let COVID-19 uh, not take their lives, Lord God. And we pray also, Lord God, for wisdom, Lord God, for those in authority over our uh, states and over our nations, Lord God, that you would give them wisdom and knowledge and how to help us, Lord God, and how to help your people, your children, Lord God. And we thank you for doing this, Lord. We trust you. We love you, Lord. And we look, Lord God, for you to continue to speak to your people and to bring us through this, Lord God, to be uh, better equipped, Lord, to do the work of your kingdom, Lord God, in Jesus' name. We're going to dismiss you just one correction. Teresa said Proverbs 21. It's oh, Proverbs 31, verse 21. But that was a great, great prayer. All right, you're released, brothers and sisters. Thank you for coming. We'll see you soon. Be safe. Shalom in Jesus' name.